Welcome back to the Master Tech, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to use push buttons and switches for industrial controls and automation. Now I will probably skew the topics in this video towards applications that might involve controls and automation, but this also is applicable for anyone who wants to use push buttons or switches for hobby applications. And far and away, the most common example of a digital on off input that is used in controls and automation and hobby circuitry and electronics are the push button and the switch. With a push button, it's either pushed or it's not pushed. With a switch, it's either in position one or position two. So today we'll be looking at the most common wiring and talking about some of the uses and applications of push buttons and switches for controls, automation, and electronics. And a huge thank you to APL who provided the hardware we use in this video. More about them later in the video. Now let's start with the most common type of push button you will see anywhere and everywhere a momentary push button. This is a type of device that is only going to read a one or high or energized when it is actively being pushed in. At an absolute minimum, these buttons may only have two wires because that's all you need to get the effects of a push button. It's basically the power feed in and then it's broken by a strip of metal that is not made until you push the button in. When you push the button in, power flows into the second wire and goes downstream. When you have a slightly more advanced button that has things like a built-in LED or a normally opened and normally closed wire, you can do a lot more functionality with it. To understand the concept of normally open and normally closed, it's useful to start from the concept of common. On this momentary push button in particular, there are five wires total. Now two of them are just the power circuit for the LED. So to discuss the controls concept going on here, we actually just want to focus on the other three wires first. And those three wires are common, normally open, and normally closed. In our case, we'll put our positive power from the nine volt battery on the common wire, which is green for these buttons. When I'm not pushing in my momentary push button, one of the wires will read nine volts and the other wire will read zero volts. The wire that's going to read nine volts when it's not being acted upon is the normally closed wire, which in this case is yellow. The wire that is going to only read nine volts when we're pushing the button in is the normally open wire, or blue in this case. So when you have a device that offers you both normally open and normally closed feedback, what you're saying is there's a wire there that will be connected to common until you push the button in, and then there's another wire there that won't be connected to common until you push the button in. So for my application, I have the ground of the LED pin connected to the negative terminal of the battery, and then I have the positive terminal of the battery connected currently to my normally open contact, meaning the light will not turn on until I close this button. Then I have the positive power from the battery coming into the comm terminal, and currently I don't need any purpose for my normally closed contact, so I'm just going to cap that off. It's not a good idea to leave live copper wires around even when you're only working with low volt DC. Now what we'll see when I push the button in is I'm actually powering the normally open wire, which now becomes closed and because it's connected to the power of the LED, it turns the LED on. To understand the difference between the normally open wire and the normally closed wire, we can just flip which one our power LED is connected to. So the red wire, which determines whether or not we have the LED powered on, is now going to get connected to my yellow wire, which correlates to normally closed on the button. Because it's normally closed, we can see that the LED turns on right away, and it doesn't turn off until I push the button in. In my handy dandy box, where I have a whole bunch of these hooked up, that's how I have both of my momentary push buttons hooked up. 
Now that's not just a deep dive into how momentary push buttons work. We also covered the fundamentals of how normally open and normally closed terminals work. For that reason, we'll really be able to fly as we talk through the next one, which is a latched push button. So the biggest difference between a latching push button and a momentary push button is right there in the name. With a momentary push button, you have to be actively holding and affecting the button for it to change from a one to a zero. With a latching push button, there's an internal and rather interesting ratcheting mechanism which will hold it in place until you press it again to release it. So effectively, you're getting the switching between a one and a zero effect that you get with a momentary push button when you press it in and release it, but it holds its state. So you can put it in one and leave it and come back later and put it to a zero. So using the exact same wiring configuration that we just had with the momentary push button where the LED was connected to the normally closed contact and when we push the button in, the LED goes off you can now see that I get the same functionality that I was getting before by having to hold it, but now I can release it and leave it in place. So now with the exact same normally open, normally closed configuration, now I have the LED connected to the normally open terminal. So once I push the button in, the light comes on. When I push it again, the light turns off. Now, in my opinion, because we're looking at a latching push button, that's a good chance for us to take a look at pivoting into the latching switch. Now, I have a couple different types of latching switches here on my handy dandy box. One that has no visual indication of whether or not it's passing power onward, but has two positions and one that does have an LED to show you whether or not it's feeding power out of the load line. The limitation of these switches, as we'll see in a second, is there's only one way for you to feed power out. So you don't have the normally open, normally closed connections that you do actually have with a two position switch like this. So it's important before selecting your hardware for any application to think through the use case. If you have a switch that is as simple as it needs to pass power on, so you just want to be able to flick a switch and feed power to a bunch of devices, flick it back the other way and kill power to those devices, something that only has one signal wire coming off of it is probably perfectly fine. In the case of my switch here, I can turn it on and I get the visual indication that the LED is on. And in this case, I'm actually triggering another LED on this push button, just as an example of how to use the switch. So when I sit here flicking my switch, I'm turning not just the LED on this, but also the LED on this light on. However, a limitation is when I turn it off, the light has to turn off. There's no way for me to use this light to turn on this light in an inverse manner, where if I wanted the green light to be on while the switch was in a de-energized way, because the switch only has one load wire and the other two are the power feed, there's no way for me to effectively do that. So if I had an application where I needed a switch to do one thing in one position and a different thing in another position, this would not be the right switch to select. But it does give me visual indication of whether or not it's feeding power down the line. So we move on to the selector switch that has four terminals on the back. And when it has four terminals, what it actually has is two sets of electrically independent contacts. So when I am in position one on this switch, two terminals are being connected in the back and the other two terminals are not connected to each other. Then when I flip the switch into its other position, the opposite two terminals get connected and the original two terminals that were connected are now broken. You can see that here by my blue and green LEDs that change, hopefully you can see that, that change state every time I actuate the switch. So here again, I have not so much normally open, normally closed configuration, but position one, position two. These are very often used not just for on off, like I have here, where I use my switch to kill power to the entire enclosure. I could use it where when it's in position one, it powers only this half of the box 
and in position two, it powers only this half of the box. That would be a normal application for it. They do make a three position selector switch as well that has the same four terminals on the back, but it also has an off position where no terminals are being connected. The most common use for that would be like on a pump, you might see a hand off auto. In hand, the left two terminals might be made, in off, no terminals might be connected, and then in auto, it might be the right two terminals. There are definitely more selector switch options out there, some of which have eight terminals on the back, some have six terminals on the back, but far and away, a two position selector switch with two sets of isolated terminals is the most common type that you'll run into and the most common type you would need. So just to show one cool variation on the two position selector switch, I also wanted to talk about this cool keyed selector switch. It's effectively exactly the same device as this two position selector switch, but rather than being able to be turned by a human hand, you have to turn it using the key that matches it. And this way, you're able to control access to who can power up a piece of equipment or machinery using a set of keys. In this case too, the key is actually locked in the device while it's on. So you can't turn something on and walk away with the keys. Anyone has the ability to turn it back off and then you can take the keys away. This is a safety measure to make sure that anybody is able to deactivate a piece of equipment if they feel it's unsafe. It's not incredibly common to see these, but it is an interesting and useful to know about variation on the selector switch. The last and most important maybe piece of equipment in industrial controls and automation that I wanna talk about that is really just another form of a latching push button is the e-stop. And the purpose of an e-stop is really to kill power to an application. Some e-stops do have terminals and feedback to a PLC or a controller or a stack light to let you know that they have been pressed. But typically, the main reason you hit an e-stop is something is wrong and you want to kill power to a device or at a minimum put it in a safe state. Wiring and functionality wise, you, everything we discussed about momentary push buttons still applies here, but typically there's an extra motion like a twisting motion or a hard pull to release an e-stop. When it gets pressed, it's supposed to be easy to press in to put things back into a safe state and require effort and intentionality to release and put back into an operational state. But it's a super useful piece of equipment to know about, especially if you're in the world of automation or controls. Now I'm going to fidget with this incredibly cool uh, box that I made to, that incorporates all of the technologies we talked about today while I tell you about the awesome sponsor of today's video, APL. They make some of the coolest and most affordable push buttons and switches for hobby applications or industrial applications. They have high quality, robust products from push buttons and switches to e-stops and key and latching switches featuring tons of cool colors and variations and different sizes and customization. I personally am super impressed with the degree of quality they have for such an affordable price, making it a great option for small business owners or hobbyists just looking for cool switches and buttons for their application. I have had a lot of fun using their products. I've been very impressed by the quality and I know that these push buttons and switches will be making appearances in my builds for a long time to come. Thank you APL for sponsoring the video and be sure to check out their catalog of awesome products linked in the description below. I hope you found this video useful. I know at first glance how to use push buttons and switches can seem really intuitive or like a basic concept, but it's actually one of the most important fundamental things to get down if you want to be doing industrial controls and automation or hobby electronics and building with robotics at home. The topics and concepts covered here will serve you great, not just as you build physical things, but it also helps you think through logic and how programming using normally open and normally closed conditions work as well. So thank you so much for watching the video. Thank you to APL for sponsoring the video. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters for allowing me to do more and more work with hardware, because obviously there is a cost to doing these bigger projects. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel by watching, leaving likes, subscribing to the channel, and leaving nice comments. As always, good luck with your projects. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.